Um, <laughs> hi, everybody. Welcome. This is the exercise portion of the pre-surgery skills classes. So welcome. Congratulations for getting to this, this far because it, it is a um, process. Um, today's session is really just about exercise and really the good news, the good news about exercise. Uh, and first, we'll talk about the exercise program, which is, which is good news in and of itself. But you have my number on your hand out there and my email address on the, after, the, after this first page, on the back of this first page here. And so you can always call me, email me. My job is really to be a resource for you and a support for you. And there's no fee, there's no limit to the exercise program, there's no requirement, okay? It really is just a benefit to you as a weight center patient. So I would see it as that, use it as you need to, okay? Just individual visits. We could talk on the phone, we could chat through email, or you can come in, either way. But it really is just figuring out where you're at right now with exercise and where you wanna go, where you want exercise to take you, and um, how to make that happen with challenges in your life, with pains, aches and pains, with jobs and kids and all that kind of stuff, how to make it work in your life. And that's really my job. Um, so there's no extra fee, not required. Um, my job is to give you good, solid information, right? If you Google exercise or fitness, you get gazillion hits, right? There's tons of information out there in exercise. Some of it is based upon bodybuilding. You go to a gym, they'll tell you what to do. It might be based upon bodybuilding, which is a very different goal than ours. So it might be based on different goals than you have. Or maybe you were an athlete before or in the military before, and, um, and that was what you trained for. Now it's very different, and life is very different, and your body might be different. So give you good quality information based upon quality research. That's my goal. Um, to give you skills, how to do this now, how to work around back pain, knee pain, job pressures, things like that, lack of equipment, lack of time, how to work around those things. So a lot of skill building and then support. One of the ways I do that is through a weekly email that I send out, just information about exercise, motivation every week, just a short little email. You can be on that email list if you want to, if you're not already, I know some of you already are, and um, just send me an email. At that email address, give me your name and your email address, and I will put you on that list. Those come right from me. It's a way that we can stay in touch every week, and many times patients will respond back to that email and say, hey, what do you think about this? Or, yay, I reached this goal, and we can stay in contact that way. Or ongoing sessions before and after surgery. Like I said, there's no limit to that right now, okay? So, any questions about the exercise program? You would simply schedule by calling the weight center number itself, the number up there, okay? So, I um, received permission from many of my patients to use their pictures in this presentation, which I'm very excited about because they're very motivating. However, I want you to focus on your goals, okay? So when you see patients doing the water, warrior road dash or all kinds of crazy things, that's not the goal here, okay? So just keep that in mind. It really is just meant to show you that um, it can happen. And I put some quotes in there from patients, um, but I want you to think about what your goal is. So this first page, that little picture frame on the first page of your handout is for doing that. So I invite you to take a few minutes now to jot down or draw pictures, anything that describes, even close your eyes and imagine you at your best health, a year, five years from now, whenever you plan on getting there, and you will. What's that? I didn't miss that, sorry. What was that? Draw a Barbie. Draw a Barbie, yeah, Barbie. <laughs> so if you're not a good artist, write down adjectives. What do you want to feel like? Energized, happy, content, healthy. Um, you know, draw a picture of you doing great things that you plan on doing. Whatever it is for you, very individualized. So if you have a good flow of thoughts, keep going with that as I'm talking. Um, but I invite you to keep coming back to this. This is your intrinsic motivation. This is the motivation for exercise. These are the reasons that you got here in the first place. When you came for orientation meeting or you watched that online, the reason you said, you know what, I gotta check this out. This is, I can't live like this anymore, right? Those moments that you said, I want this, I don't want that. That is your motivation. That's your true motivation. 
And so all of the number on the scale and you know, ideal BMI and all that stuff is your true motivation. That's not your true motivation. Your true motivation comes from internal. And so I'm going to talk about some myths today. Myth number one is I'm just not motivated. Okay? We all have motivation for something. right? If there's something that you don't like doing, you might avoid it. Right? Like dishes in my house. I avoid doing dishes because <laughs> I don't like it. And so I will avoid it until I really have to do them, and then it's not good. <laughs> so, so it's better if I just do it. But if I find the reasons to do it, and the pros outweigh the cons, the pros of having nice clean dishes outweigh the cons of doing dishes, then I will do it. Right? Not happily, but I'll do them. So if I can get somebody else to do them, I'll do it. <laughs> but it doesn't work that way with exercise. So we all have really good reasons why we choose to do things and why we choose to avoid things. And when we're avoiding exercise, usually that's a good clue into maybe we're trying to exercise too hard or the wrong type of exercise for ourselves right now or the wrong environment. Maybe you'd rather be alone than in a gym or with the wrong exercise partner. Okay? All of those are clues that something's going on that you're avoiding exercise if you're struggling with motivation. Um, so we can create those instant results. You should leave every exercise session feeling good and every exercise session to feel like you're getting a step closer to what you wrote in that picture. Okay, that should be the purpose of exercise. So we're going to talk about that a little bit more today. But this, everybody has a motivation. We just have to dig in and connect it, connect exercise with what you put in there and wh where you want to go. All right, so your true motivation, it's not necessarily the scale. This is my good friend George, one of our, our patients here, who um, was always, quote unquote, the fat kid. He told me that, and, um, and he really embraced the exercise piece of this, as you can tell. <laughs> That's him doing the Warrior Road Dash. Um, but now he's doing all kinds of races, raising money, doing half marathons, things like that, and just having a grand time. This is one of our patients did the Warrior Road Dash as well. But I love this last thing that she said. Even though I didn't win this race, I'm a winner in my book because I didn't give up. And she, you know, she states how small milestones are really important, and that's a really really important thing to pay attention to. These are real patients telling us this. You know, this is, this is what I learned from that. So this outside motivation is usually when we start exercising. This is why we usually start. I want to see the scale move. I want to you know, lose weight. I want to get down to a certain size. Um, I want to even you know, get to a certain minutes of exercise or conquer this type of exercise. It might be very extrinsic. I want to keep up with this person who exercises. All those external things. And if we can move it a little bit more towards this internal reason to exercise, I want to feel good. I want to have more energy. I don't care how many minutes I do, I just want to have more energy. You know, I don't care who I'm with, I want to feel good when I'm done. I want to feel good about myself. If we can move the reasons we exercise to those internal reasons, motivation just happens. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Right? If you can think about that. If you're just trying to make the scale move, it's so frustrating, right? You might do perfect one week, perfect. And then you come in, you get on the scale, and oh, it didn't move. I'm so frustrated. This exercise is not working. But then when I ask patients how they feel, they say, well, I feel great. She's up there. Thank you. And the orange shirt up there. Yeah, thank you. Um, they say, well, I feel great. I feel so energized and healthy. I said, well, isn't that the goal? Isn't that the ultimate goal? Because let me tell you, I've seen patients get down to their goal weight and not feel very good. And I've seen patients get halfway to their goal weight, like that woman in that last picture. She was only halfway to her goal weight, but she felt great. And there's the, the scale is not going to be the ultimate answer, right? I bet you didn't put down a number there, right? I bet you put down, I want to feel good. And even if you did, that's not the ultimate goal, right? If you did, it's OK, because um, you might have a number in mind. But that number doesn't mean anything if you don't feel good, right? And so that's really, really important to make exercise um, in, in the service of accomplishing this intrinsic goal. So this puzzle here is a great way to check in with yourself. And we're going to go through each piece of this puzzle, okay? Um, and how they relate to what's important for you with exercise and your ultimate goal. What holds that whole thing together, though? What's the middle piece there? Consistency. Yeah, meaning and instant gratification, meaning like you feel good instantly, right? And realistic. Those are things that lead to consistency. So if you did this super duper hard workout, you know, one of those three month programs where you can get ripped and lose all this weight, all these infomercials that promise that. If you did one of those programs for three months and you got those results, how long would those results last for? 
not long. If you kept it up, would they last? Yeah. If you stopped after three months, would they last? No. So exercise is very reversible, <laughs> unfortunately. You could work really hard for three months and accomplish something, but then you've got to keep that up. And they don't necessarily say that on those infomercials, do they? They don't really say, well, you've you got to keep this up your whole life if you want those results. No, they just talk about those three months. Consistency is the most important piece. I don't care what you're doing. If you can't keep it up, you're not going to keep those results. So every piece of this puzzle that you put in your lifestyle, asking, you know what, could I keep this level up for the rest of my life? It doesn't have to be the same exercise, but could I keep this up for the rest of my life? How long do I want these results for? Okay, so sustainability is our main goal, and that means tying it with what's important to you. It means setting it up so you feel good afterwards and keeping it realistic for you right now. It might be very different than what it is in the future. Okay, so myth number two, just moving more doesn't count. You know, people say to me, oh, well, you know, it's not exercise. It's not worth it. If I don't, if I just move around, what's the point if I park at the back of the parking lot? What does it do? Well, there's this crazy thing now called sitting disease. Who's heard of it? Anybody heard of sitting disease? So let me say this now, because as we're talking about sitting disease, if you have a strong impulse to get up and move while we're talking about this, I am absolutely okay with that. So anyone who wants to stand up while we're talking because we're talking about sitting disease, that is absolutely fine. Okay, but sitting disease is what we've learned through research about sitting, prolonged sitting, has a, higher, a high risk of cancers, diabetes, um, heart disease, that even people who exercise regularly, like go to the gym in the morning and then you sit at your computer desk all day, still have a higher risk of heart disease, diabetes, and cancers. So exercise is a great health promoter. Exercise is tremendous for promoting health. But what we're, knowing, what we're learning from research is that it's also what you do the rest of the day. Something happens when we sit for prolonged periods that sends signals to the body that something is wrong and increases inflammation. Okay? And this research is so kind of hands down, almost like the research that smoking, when smoking came out and we realized, ooh, this is really bad, we've got to get people off cigarettes. It's kind of like that, like, ooh, we've got to get people out of their chairs, this is really bad. Right? If you've received a pedometer from your healthcare company, from your employer, if you um, are encouraged to move more from anybody, that's because it costs money to sit. <laughs> it costs more money to have people sitting because we know it increases risks of disease. So we were better, now, that's why companies are willing to pay some money now to get people up and moving because they know it's gonna lower their healthcare costs. So it's that powerful. So I see this as a great opportunity for us to improve our health very easily every hour getting up for five or 10 minutes or so, if possible. Some people say, well, I'm a truck driver. I cannot get up out of my truck every hour. I will not get where I need to go. Absolutely true. So if you have that kind of job where you have to sit, that's okay. The rest of your day, move as much as you can, okay? But times that you're sitting, watching TV, on the computer, um, and even if you're just driving somewhere, aware, oh, well, I've been sitting for an hour. I better get up and move. I gotta get up and move. I gotta tell my body everything's okay. Don't increase inflammation, okay? And that becoming a habit, also helps us with weight loss, right? You ever take loose change out of your pocket and throw it in a jar? You ever do that? And you bring it to one of those machines and all of a sudden you have $100 that you didn't know you had, right? This is kind of like that, like loose change in a jar, 10 calories there, 25 calories there, little bits throughout your day, adding up to 100, 200 extra calories a day, just by adding more lifestyle activity, putting it in your day, adds up like loose change. Wouldn't it be nice to have an extra 100, 200 extra calories in your day to wiggle around with and play around with, right? That'd be cool, right? So this is how we can do that. And the studies on lifestyle activity are really, really great that they tell us, you know what, it works just as well as structured exercise in terms of helping people lose weight. And it's more sustainable for some people. So just moving more throughout your day. Who does that now? Does anybody like make efforts to move more throughout their day? Yeah, what do you do? Yeah. Right, like and the old days. Yeah. <laughs> well, it does help, though. I said, yeah. you know, and then yeah. I make myself right. at night when everybody's sleeping and make myself get up and go to the kitchen and get something to drink. You know, yeah. Back, okay. Yeah. So you're kind of, you have to because your TV doesn't have a remote, but yeah. you're also saying, hey, I'll go get that for you. What else can I do? And you're making yourself get up. Good well, for I you. Think, yeah. That's, yeah. I'm glad yeah, yeah, that's great. Kind of yeah. built in, like the old days, right? When we only had no remote control. <laughs> right, right, right. 
<laughs> the remote control is much easier. But these are always, and did you guys see that last, that last um, little average there? The average person burned 700 to 800 fewer calories a day than in 1970. This study was done in 1995 that they discovered this. How different is life since 1995? A lot, right? We have a lot more computer things to do. We have a lot more reasons to sit. And so I've been, I would imagine to say if they did this study now, it would be much more. But imagine 700 to 800 fewer calories a day. That's tremendous. Wow. I remember 1970, three TV channels, no real reasons to sit, right? One car per family. You walked if you wanted to get somebody someplace else, right? And you were outside until the streetlights came on when you were a kid, right? Yeah. That was like universal. I know. And so, um, so this 700 to 800 calories a day that we've missed over the past few decades is tremendous, making it harder for us to lose weight. We've got to get some of that back, but it's got to be artificial. So the cure for lifestyle acti life, um, sitting disease is lifestyle activity. Moving more throughout the day burns calories, improves health. It's flexible. It's easy. You can fit it in in a busy day. Okay. And so how do you do it? You could track your minutes of activity a day. Or you could look into getting a pedometer or a Fitbit or using an app on your phone. Okay. Does anybody use a pedometer or a Fitbit or a Fitband right now? Yeah. What do you notice about using it? It's different. It's different. <laughs> In what way? Well, I, I get more results because I, I like when I look at it. Yeah. You know what I mean? It, it makes when you move. I'm at the gym, I'm on the or something like that. It kind of encourages you to oh, work harder. Yeah. Okay. So it, it gives you that number to shoot for and yeah. Okay. Oh, I, I yeah, you should, right? If you have a little bit of competitive, competitiveness in you, it works, right? And so, um, so, and that's what studies tell us, that people who wear pedometers move more. Just by wearing a pedometer, you'll tend to move more because you have that awareness inside, in front of you saying, ooh, I didn't move much today. I've been sitting a lot. Or, wow, yeah, I was really active today. Who here is tired at the end of the day? Anybody? Yeah, right? Sometimes it's hard to tell whether that's a, a mental fatigue, like, oh, I'm so tired, or physical fatigue. The mental fatigue feels physical, doesn't it, many times? It's hard to tell the difference. If you've been sitting at a computer or in meetings all day, you're tired, but it's not physical. If you've ever done some activity when you're mentally tired, you know you get that second wind. Your body said, yes, I need some activity. I've been sitting all day. And that second wind is your body saying, thank you. And so pedometers help us to realize that. You can look at your pedometer and say, oh, you know what? I'm mentally tired. I am not physically tired. I need to do something physical. The nice thing about these is they tell you how many calories you're burning, how many miles you've walked, and it just tracks it for you. So the kind of low-tech way is these pedometers, these pocket pedometers. Older pedometers have to sit on your waistband, and they, if they tilt, they don't quite get all the steps. But these newer um, phase of pedometers, these pocket or wear anywhere pedometers, are nice because you can stick them in your pocket, you can clip it to your waistband, and it'll track steps really well. One example is an Armron pedometer. It's up there. And, but you can get other brands. You can just search for best pedometers out there and, and see which one you like the best. But these are really nice because they're very simple and easy to use, but very accurate. Okay. And then some phones, some smartphones have an app that you can download for free if you have your phone on you all the time. These are designed to wear all day long. So if you only you know, have it on you when you're moving around, it's not going to do us much good. But if you have it on you all day, the phone apps are great. And then the more high-tech, more expensive versions, like these pedometers run about $20 to $30. These are like $70 to $100 or more, the Fitbit, the Fitband, those accelerometers. They interface with your computer, your phone, and they give you all kinds of graphs and information about your sleep and your activity and all of that. They'll coordinate with things um, with online food tracking apps as well, so it'll help you balance um, how much you're taking in and how much you're moving. Okay. So if you're a visual person, person and you like these kind of things or numbers really motivate you, this is a great tool. Or if you're really busy and you're really not loving exercise right now or it's just not working for you, this is a great place to start. If you're struggling with your weight at this point and you need kind of an extra boost, adding one of these in, you'll probably move more and burn more calories and keep you aware. And what this does the most is it helps us to get rid of those really low calorie burning days. We all have them, like those really sedentary days. If you look at that on a sedentary day and you haven't moved just, you'll say, oh gosh, I really have to move. Those are usually the ones that really sabotage weight loss. So what you would do, and I, I gave you a recording sheet on that, um, on that last page of your, oh, I hope it's there. Darn, it's not there. I don't know what happened. I'll get that to you guys, okay? I'll show you what it looks like. Um, but there's a recording sheet that you could just track, and this is the steps to do it. You would just wear the pedometer all week long and get your baseline. 
okay, and see how many steps you have. And the average person takes between 2,000 and 6,000 steps a day, okay? 2,000 steps is about a mile for the average person. Anyone want to guess how many calories you burn in one mile? When you move your body one mile? About 100. It depends on how much you weigh, but about 100, okay? Those little 100 calorie snack packs of Oreos or whatever, a mile. Wow. Right? So if the average person is only walking about 2,000 steps a day, about a mile, about 100 extra calories, yeah, it's really hard to lose weight if you're only walking 2,000 steps a day. It's really hard because you're not burning that much. You don't have a lot of wiggle room there. And so, so the idea is to get your baseline. But if you only get 2,000 steps a day right now and you can boost it up even 1,000 steps, that's great. Okay? Um, so you get your average and then you set a goal to increase that by 10%. Why 10%? Sounds really small, doesn't it? Guess what? Physiologically, for our body, 10% is how much our body can adapt to in one week. Right? So if you were walking for a 30-minute walk and you said, you know what, I've got to up this a little bit. If you didn't know that 10% goal, how much would you increase by? I know I would do like 45 minutes. If I didn't know that goal, I would say, well, I better, I better go off 45 minutes. And the next week I'll go to 60 minutes. Right? My body's going, wait a minute, can't adapt to that. And something is probably going to break down. My knee's going to start hurting, my back's going to start hurting, I'm going to feel crummy, and I'm going to say, oh, this exercise stuff doesn't work. 10% per week would be 33 minutes the next week. Who would ever consider doing 33 minutes? But that's a realistic goal. Remember the thing that helps keep it consistent is realistic? Setting realistic goals? So using this 10% goal set, helps you set realistic goals based upon your physiology, what your body can tolerate. And so doing that 10% per week really keeps it realistic and doable and you feel better. So if you get 3,000 steps on average, your next goal is 3,300 steps. Not going to bed till I get 3,300 steps. I've heard of people walking around their dining room table at midnight to try and get to that goal. But it makes you do silly things, but it makes you do things that you wouldn't normally do to burn calories when you're aware of it. And then you just continue adding 10% or some weeks your goal might just be to maintain or add 5%. But that goal is a good goal. Just small amounts of activity. But everything you add becomes a habit. So this is what the, the chart looks like. And you can do this on your own, too. But I can get you guys this chart. Um, you know, you track what you did for activity. What got it, you know, oh, I, you know, I could park further at work. That was an idea. You know, things like that. Just keeping track of what you could do, ideas. And then you get your average. And then the next week, you try and add some things in. And you try and go for that 10% increase, OK? So how active are you in your vision? That, that vision that you wrote down, all those words and pictures that you wrote down when we first started, how active are you? Very active, not active, what do you think? Plan on leading an active lifestyle? Plan on doing some good stuff? Yeah, so how active do you wanna be? I love this picture that this woman sent me of her playing golf with her, with her family. She said she wouldn't have played golf and she definitely wouldn't have had her picture taken a year ago. All right, so any questions on lifestyle activity or pedometers or all of that, sitting disease, all of that stuff, okay? Um, cardiovascular exercise, the next piece of that puzzle. Anyone need to sit up, stand up and stretch a little bit? No, we're okay? All right. <laughs> so, um, so cardiovascular exercise, what is, we might call it cardio, we might call it aerobic exercise, but cardio is anything you're moving continuously not stopping and going. So something like shopping or cleaning would go in that lifestyle activity piece. It still has a place because we know it's still valuable to burn calories throughout your day. But in order to improve your heart and your circulation and improve your stamina, um, we've got to do something more continuous. So a moderate walk, um, cycling, swimming, anything dancing, anything you're moving continuously that the intensity is not so high that you have to stop or the nature of the activity is not so erratic that you have to stop. So anything you can do continuously, okay? Um, and 30 minutes three times a week is enough to improve stamina. It's enough to get those benefits, right? 30 minutes three times a week for improving stamina. I think that's a bargain. What do you think? An hour and a half a week for better stamina and all these other great benefits, burning more calories. So as you improve your fitness level, you can burn more and more calories within that 30 minutes, right? And you guys have noticed that, I'm sure, right? And so it improves health, cuts your risk of heart disease, diabetes, cancers. I mean, the, the list, go, list goes on and on. One 30-minute bout of moderate intensity lowers your blood pressure for up to 22 hours after, and so keeps it down for up to 22 hours. Lowers your blood sugar if it's elevated and keeps it down for up to 72 hours depending on the intensity. 
right? Lowers your triglycerides, part of that cholesterol, lowers it. Boosts your immune system for three hours. If you were going to get a flu shot, exercising before makes the flu shot work better. Your immune system is just stronger for three hours afterwards, right? And boosts your metabolism. Cardio boosts your metabolism for about three hours. We're going to get to strength training, which boosts your metabolism for 24 hours. We'll get to that. But a nice metabolism boost after cardio, okay? <coughs> Improves sleep. Who's noticed they sleep better when they exercise? Right? That's a, one of the best benefits. And then one of the best benefits is improving stress levels, right? Lowering stress, feeling a little bit calmer. Anyone notice that? That's one of the best benefits, right? Just feeling a little calmer, a little more in control. Okay, I can handle life again. I'm good. You know, all of those great benefits and improving mood. We know it counteracts depression, all those great things beyond weight loss, right? So if you put down, I want to be happier in that, in that thing, right? Exercise can get you a step closer there. Isn't that great? So one of the things, so three times, three to seven days a week, 30 minutes or more, and you can always accumulate those minutes. We'll talk about that in a second, but at a moderate pace. So myth number three and four is I have to sweat to get a good workout and exercise has to be hard, okay? I have to sweat is one of those big myths because it's out there. People think, wow, I'm sweating. I got a great workout. We could cramp, crank up the heat in this room, couldn't we, and all sweat. Would that be a good workout? No, right? Sweating has nothing to do with how hard you're working. It has to do with the, the environment. It has to do with how you're dressed, how hydrated you are and your genetics and the type of activity that you're doing. So if you did a spin class and sweat up a storm and did the same intensity on a bike outside where there's wind and there's, you know, and the, it, the sweat's evaporating and you didn't sweat, you would still get the same workout. So sweating really is not a good indicator of how hard you're working. And in fact, after weight loss surgery, it's dangerous to make yourself sweat. And I always have to say this because I go into stores and they still sell those plastic suits. The, you, know, you know what I'm talking about, right? The plastic suits that make you sweat. Um, I think wrestlers use them. Um, but I always feel like I have to say this because I will get emails from patients like, could I use one of those suits to help lose the weight and melt off fat? It does feel like you're melting off fat when you're sweating, right? It feels like, oh, it's just like melting like butter, but it's not. <laughs> I wish that was the case. Um, but after surgery, when you can't rehydrate very easily, you could end up in the hospital dehydrated from making yourself sweat so much. So you don't want to make yourself sweat after surgery. So let go of this idea that it has anything to do with burning more fat, right? Yeah, same idea, yeah. same thing, same, idea. same thing. Yeah, you really can't like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I wish. I wish it was that easy. I'd be out of a job, but I wish it was that easy. <laughs> um, so this is another another one doing all kinds of great stuff. All this stuff. There's a great picture of her at the end um, of this of this. But all this stuff that she's doing on her bucket list that she never thought she'd be doing at this point. So this is a great way to tell if you're working at a right intensity. Heart rate is a good way also, but heart rate, again, um, is really hard to measure. It's hard to measure heart rate unless you have a heart rate monitor. And the equation that they use to estimate what your heart rate should be when you're exercising. So if you got on a piece of equipment, you put in your age, and it said, okay, work between this rates to get a great workout. Maybe fat burning, maybe cardio, which really um, doesn't do much for us, and I'll talk about that. But, um, but that, that equation has a plus or minus 10 to 12 beat error to it. So it means that it could be off by 10 to 12 beats. It's just an estimate based upon your age, okay? But everybody's very different, and so your heart rate is gonna be different. So it's not a perfect tool by any means. You might be working so hard trying to get your heart rate up and it just won't go up. Some medications for blood pressure or heart disease lower heart rate and blood pressure. So that equation will not work for you at all, all right? And because it's hard to measure heart rate, we have this chart that correlates really well with heart rate. So when we do studies and we measure exactly where someone's heart rate should be and ask them to rate it, usually when they're at a three, they're usually about 70% of their heart rate max, their real heart rate max, okay, where they should be for their heart rate. And usually at a four, they're usually around 80%. So we know that if you're working at that range, that moderate to somewhat heavy range, comfortable breathing, you know, you're noticing a little more shortness of breath, maybe a little challenging. You might say, yeah, this is a good challenge. I could do this for a while, okay? Um, that would probably be working at your exact right level. If you start to feel like a five or more, like, okay, this is getting uncomfortable, when can I stop? <sighs> That's probably too high. And the risks start outweighing the benefits for our purposes. Yes, athletes, military have to push that hard. If you're in the you know, reality TV show where weight loss is really important, you might have to push that hard. But for most of us, we don't have to push that hard. That's not reality, 
okay? Pushing that hard means you're challenging your body too much and you run a risk of injury, but you also run the risk of never ever wanting to exercise again, right? And that's a big risk. So keeping it again realistic at a good level keeps it, keeps it something that you wanna go back for more. So it's a good challenge, you'll wanna go back for more. So your breathing, your shortness of breath level is gonna tell you how you're doing with exercise. And if you're always at that range, moderate to somewhat heavy, you're probably doing just fine. If it's light and you could sing a song, it's probably too easy. You're not getting as much of a challenge. If it's a five or above, probably a little too hard. If you start approaching a five, start pulling it back a little bit. One thing you want to avoid is sudden starts and stops. Okay, so a sudden stop like you're, you know, okay, I'm pumping up a hill and then, oh, I gotta stop. You know, when you stop, what happens when you're exercising is the muscles push against the veins and help to send blood back up into the heart to get more oxygen and send it out. So that's a good thing when you're exercising. When you stop, the blood tends to stay more in the legs and doesn't get as much sent back up into the heart. And we call that pooling of the, muscle, of the blood. But what that does is it sends less blood flow back to the heart. And that's usually when people will get into trouble, if they're gonna get into trouble with their heart, it's a sudden in increase in exercise, a sudden burst of intense exercise, or a sudden stop. Those big changes in the heart make a big difference, okay? So no sudden starts, no sudden stops, gradually working up to that moderate to somewhat heavy, and then when you need to slow down, you slow down, even if you have to just march in place or sit, keep those legs moving, okay, until your breathing comes back down. So just remember that if your breathing is heavy, your heart's working really, really hard, and it's time to ease up a little bit. Doable, right? So moderate is just fine. You don't have to push yourself super hard. Cardio prepares you for surgery. Cardio is one of the best ways to prepare you for weight loss surgery, any surgery, because surgery is a little bit of work on the heart. It makes the heart work harder when you're under anesthesia, and so if your heart's stronger and better able to handle that, surgery is less risky. Okay, which is why the surgeons want you to exercise before surgery. They know you're going to be healthier. They know you're going to have less risk of complications and a better recovery the more fit you are. Okay, for weight loss surgery itself, cardiovascular exercise is really one of the only ways that we can do spot reducing. Right? Some people say, well, what can I do to get rid of fat here? We can't really spot reduce. But cardiovascular exercise helps us to lose more weight around our organs, selectively losing that internal fat that's next to our organs. So when they go in there to do surgery, it's easier, okay? So when you're more cardiovascularly fit and you're using that as part of your weight loss, you're gonna lose more weight around your organs, surgery is easier. Also, the third thing that cardio does, remember we talked about improving mood, improving how you feel about yourself, self-esteem. If you're feeling better about yourself, you might say, you know what, I'm ready to tackle that, so that soda habit, or I'm ready to tackle that, you know, that changing my diet. So what we know from studies is that when people exercise, it also trickles down to confidence in making other lifestyle changes because you're just feeling better and more confident, okay? So this is a woman who hikes with her son now. Lots of pictures, great pictures of people doing things with their family, which is awesome. Um, I feel exhilarated when I get out and exercise. Isn't that awesome? So what if walking is painful or tiring and I can't be on my feet? We say, oh, just go out for a walk for exercise like it's easy, or do the stairs instead of the elevator like it's easy, right? And that's not always easy when you have knee pain, back pain, or it's just hard to be on your feet for a while. And so there's some options here that you could do. One is chair aerobics, right? The, those videos there are chair aerobics. You can check, you can just Google chair aerobics, you'll get some free videos. These are DVDs that you can buy. I love these though, because they're young instructors. It's not like senior fitness. It's a real workout, total body workout. They've got chair boxing, they've got chair salsa, chair belly dancing, <laughs> um, <laughs> whatever you like. But it's all in a chair, okay? Is this what you wanna do your whole life? No. Is this a bridge to get you to surgery healthier? Yes. So you get these DVDs, you do them three times a week for 30 minutes, and then you pass them on after you're done with them. Okay, so it's a bridge to get you to surgery healthier. And then when you're ready, you can stand up and exercise, okay? Um, other options, these little floor pedal things that you can get at any um, healthcare equipment store, floor pedal or, um, or tabletop. And some people I know even just use these under their desk at work and they just kind of pedal all day long and it keeps them from getting that midday lull. But for people who are limited with weight bearing, this is a really nice inexpensive way. Or you can put it on a tabletop and use your arms. Okay, something's better than nothing. There's also a lot of free videos on YouTube where they're just very simple, like walking aerobics, where you're just marching and stepping. You might be able to do part-time like this, and they, oh, my knees hurt, okay, I'm gonna sit down and do it. And just take any exercise video and do it in a chair. 
okay? So again, it's a bridge to get you to surgery healthier. Or these short walks throughout the day. So let's say you could do a five minute walk. Okay, I can walk for five minutes, then my knees start to give out. What if you did three five minute walks a day? And then that turned into six five minute walks a day very gradually or three 10 minute walks. You can accumulate 30 minutes and get just about the same benefits and the same calorie burning as if you did it all together. Okay, so it doesn't have to be this, you know, I have to do 30 minutes or I'm not gonna get any benefit from it. You can accumulate those minutes and studies show that that really works just as nice. Okay, so that's a great, great option to work up. Just got an email from a patient yesterday who started doing that and he said, gosh, I feel so much better. I'm not as depressed and I have more energy and I'm increasing what I can do every week. He was so excited, okay? How much energy and stamina will you need for that picture of you at your best health? How much energy and stamina do you plan to have? How much stamina do you want for the things that you wanna do? People say, I wanna go kayaking, I wanna go skiing, I wanna go hiking, I wanna you know, do all this great stuff. We need stamina for that. How can you start building that up now? Don't wait until then, let's start getting it now, right? Three times a week, some kind of cardio, at least three times a week for 30 minutes. All right, questions about cardio? No? Okay, so on to strength training. Let's do a little stretch. Let's just have you stand up for 30 seconds, one, you know, 15 seconds. Because <laughs> you've been sitting here for like an hour now. Okay, up and just stretch, anything you wanna do. If you can't stand, just move in the chair, just stretch, get up and move, watch your legs a little bit, tell your body everything's okay. <laughs> Good, if you want to stay standing, you can do that while I'm talking, or you can sit down. Okay, so what do you want to lose? No one ever asked you that. They ask you how much weight you want to lose. I'm asking you, what do you want to lose? Fat. Fat. <laughs> That's a no-brainer. So if you just dieted, you would lose fat. You would also lose muscle. If you've ever just dieted and lost weight, you've lost fat and probably lost some muscle along with it. If you do a combination of diet and exercise, depending on the type of exercise that you do, you will lose more fat than just dieting alone, and you will gain muscle or at least not lose muscle. You'll preserve your muscle. And if you just aged along with the rest of America, most people in our industrialized society lose um, muscle as they get older and gain fat, okay? About five to seven pounds of muscle per decade after age 30 or 40. All right, well, what's the big deal about muscle? It weighs more than fat, let's just get rid of it. What do we need it for? It's hard to lose muscle. It's hard to gain muscle. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, you lose the weight, uh -huh. right? Uh, exercise. Yeah. And then the muscle. When you do, all right. I have a friend that had the operation years yeah. ago. She has a rat beard. Yeah. She's lost a hundred pounds. Yeah. And can't lose any more because her muscles turn. You know, she has to. Yeah. She okay. has to like. You know. Every yeah. day she's gonna go to the gym to keep that off. Right. Pounds, right. You know so, so yeah. It does turn that way. So this anybody. might this might answer that question for you. This is what we're talking about now. Muscle doesn't turn into fat. Fat doesn't turn into muscle. They're two absolutely okay. different tissues. So they yeah. don't transfer one to the other. They're different cells. Okay. So I'm gonna. So, <laughs> so I, I have a, I have an idea. I'll, I'll, I think this is gonna answer it. So um, so muscle. What else does muscle do for us? We're gonna get there. What else does muscle do for us? It makes you look good, right. Muscle gives you some definition in your body. What's that strong, who said strong? Yeah, it makes you strong, right? Anything that you have to do in everyday life, you don't just need stamina to carry in those groceries, you need strength. You need muscle strength to get up the stairs. You need muscle strength to be able to do things, get up and down off the floor, right? You need strength for that, not just stamina. So cardio gives us stamina, but strength training gives us strength, and we need that for everyday activities. What else does muscle do? It is our metabolism. The more muscle you have on your body right now, the higher your metabolism. If you've used those muscles in the past 24 hours, your metabolism is even higher. Okay, that's really good news. So, do you wanna lose your metabolism? No. Do you wanna lose your strength? No. You wanna lose your quality of life? No. no. Guess what, cardio doesn't do it for us. Cardio does not hold on to our muscle, especially if you're losing weight through rapid weight loss, like after weight loss surgery. Not on a lot of calories, your body's gonna pull from anything it can and it's gonna break down that muscle if you're not using it. This is kind of what your muscle looks like, like a cross section of your muscle, okay? And so if you're doing cardio or just light weights, like toning, you know, because people say I don't wanna get big bulky muscles, you're just using a small portion of those muscle fibers over and over and over again. 
okay? What you don't use, you lose. So all those other muscle fibers that you're not using, you're losing. And when I say lose muscle fibers, they don't go away. All those fibers are still there. So when we say lose muscle, it doesn't disappear. The fibers are there. They just kind of shrink and they're not as active and they're not able to be used as well. At any time, you can reactivate those muscle fibers. 90 years old, anyone can gain muscle at any age, at any stage. So if you've ever lost muscle through aging, one day of, of bed rest, you start to lose muscle. 24 hours of bed rest, you start to lose muscle. After, uh, in menopause, perimenopause, women lose twice as much muscle as any other time in their life. And with rapid weight loss, you lose muscle and just regular aging. Aging, like not normal aging, how we tend to age of not using our muscles. Because look at people like Jack Lane, right? You can hold on to your muscle as long as you use them. So if you're telling your body, don't get rid of those muscle fibers, I'm using them. Take the fat, please. Don't get rid of those, I'm using them by doing strength training. So when you're doing strength training and you're really challenging those muscles to fatigue, you're using more and more of those muscle fibers over and over and over again. And when they're used, they're activated. For the next 24 hours, they're repairing and getting stronger. And as they're doing it, they're boosting your metabolism. Okay? But if you're only doing a small portion of those muscle fibers, the ones you haven't used, they're not doing anything for you. Okay? So what strength training does is really activate all of that metabolism that you have available to you and tells your body, hold on to that muscle. Will you get big bulky muscles? I've been here for 10 years. I've been doing this work for 25 years or so. Never, ever have I had anyone come to me and say, I've gained too much muscle. It's a problem. I've gained too much muscle. Never, never. We've got so much working against us to hold on to our muscle, aging, menopause, weight loss, life, right? It doesn't look good on a woman. It's, you know, the women who get big bulky muscles have to work really, really hard, twice as hard as any man, <laughs> because they, they don't, we don't have the equipment to build muscle as easily as men. Some steroids definitely help too, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so you know, if that's the road you want to go down, you know, right. we'll talk. But, um, but really, for most of us, we've got so much working against our muscle that we're just trying to hold on to what we have and activate what we have. So I would not worry about getting big, big bulky muscles. But if you are a person, male or female, who tends to gain muscle easier, and genetically some people just tend to gain muscle much easier, you could cut down the strength training and activate those muscles without really telling those muscles to get really big, okay? But for most of us, I'd say you know, 90, 99% of us, we're just trying to hold on to what we have, especially with aging and weight loss, all right? So strength, low level strength training doesn't do it, cardio doesn't do it. What does it is this challenging your muscles, okay? And this is the metabolism piece. Muscles are bad for weight loss. I'm gonna lose weight first and then I'll gain the muscle back, then I'll tone, right? I said that before, I know. <laughs> and we know now that that's not true. Yeah, you could lose weight and lose muscle, but it's really hard to get it back. So I'd rather not lose it in the first place, right? And 75% of our metabolism is, has to do with our muscle, our lean tissue, our muscle, okay? And so, and a quarter of that is our daily movement, that's our lifestyle activity. So we have a lot of control over our metabolism. Okay, a lot of control over our metabolism. When we say, oh, my metabolism just stopped, it's usually because we've lost the muscle at, at some point in life, okay? So we can activate this and have some control over that. All right, so muscle is not bad. This is one of our patients. Look at her arms. Wow, I know. I'm hoping she's breathing there. I'm really hoping she's breathing. Because <laughs> that's a really important thing to do when you're, at any time really, but when you're exercising, breathing is really important. But when people say to me, what about the skin? I'm gonna, you know, I don't wanna get skin. We don't have anything to do, we, we really can't control the skin. What we can control is us underneath, okay? And so what you have control over is the muscle. The skin is probably gonna do what the skin's gonna do, but I can tell you, the patients who do strength training come back to me and say, you know what, I feel great. I feel really good in my body. I feel strong. I can do what I need to do. The patients who don't do strength training are the ones that come back and say, you know, my back hurts still. My knees still hurt. You know, I injured my shoulder. Or I just, I just don't, you know, I don't feel good. I don't feel strong. I bought a bike and I can't ride it. My legs get too tired. I can't get up, the, up off the floor now, not because of my weight, but because my legs just are not strong enough. I hear this all the time from patients who are not doing strength training, and it is very tempting to not do it. You're gonna get on the scale, you're gonna see tremendous weight loss, you're gonna be so excited, you're gonna say, woohoo, I don't need to exercise. 
okay? But you're not gonna fall for that, right? <laughs> you know now what happens inside. And so, um, so it increases our metabolism, strength training does. Bone strength, you tend to lose bone when you lose muscle, holding on to that bone. So those muscles pulling on the bones stimulate the bones to get stronger so you don't end up with weaker bones. Um, but one of those bigger things that people lose their balance easier when they lose muscle. This is one of those things that happens with aging is we lose muscle, we lose bone strength, and we lose balance and we end up falling. And so if you can hold on to your muscle, you'll hold on to your balance, your bone strength, and less likely to fall, less likely to fracture. Um, but when we have these small muscles that run up and down our spine that support our spine. When we say losing muscle or losing strength in a muscle, you don't just lose it in the bigger muscles. You lose it in those smaller, really important muscles. And the ones that I see injuries in is the back muscles, right? The people, their backs aren't as strong and so they're not able to hold themselves up and stand up straight and their back isn't as supported. So if you've got issues with your back, that muscle is your best friend to hold your back strong and protect your spine. And so keeping the back muscles strong, keeping the shoulder muscles strong, those little rotator cuffs that hold your shoulder in place, losing muscle there, a little bit of muscle there, you reach back in your car and, ooh, I pulled my shoulder out. Okay, so you wanna keep your shoulders strong and knees too. If you're doing this so that you can go on for knee replacement, keeping those quadriceps strong, those muscles around the knees really strong will help keep those arthritic joints supported. And studies show that people who do strength training and have arthritis have less arthritis pain as they increase strength around their knees. So it doesn't change the arthritis, but those arthritic joints have more support. So those key areas are so, so important. Um, so holding on to muscle is really important for keeping us um, strong and injury free and it's what we have control over you know at, as we talk about skin okay this was one of the most interesting studies i ever read <laughs> about um about quality of life and loss of muscle so they did studies on people with ga after gastric bypass surgery and they found that the lower calorie diets after gastric bypass surgery greater loss of muscle and that connected to less strength that connected to less ability to do things in everyday life, like getting up and down off the floor or carrying in groceries, and that connected to lower quality of life scores. So they found a direct connection between how much muscle someone lost and their lower quality of life scores on a, on a, on a test. They were saying, I'm not as satisfied with my life, and their muscle was measured less. Right? And you can imagine that, and I've seen it. If you lose muscle, you're less likely to do things. All right. So you get my point, right? <laughs> so strength training, what do you, how do you do it? How do you do strength training? Good news is you don't have to worry about weather. You can do this all inside, right? So it's weatherproof. You can do it all at home. And that's one of the big things that we do when we meet is talk about strength training, how to do it with equipment that you might be able to get very easily at home and how to work around pain issues, how to get what you want for it. Some people come in and say, I wanna improve my golf game and we can design a program for that. So it can be very specific to what you put in that, that vision of yourself. But two to three non-consecutive days a week. So two to three every other day or so, you wanna give those muscles a day of recovery. One to three sets, so a set is a group of repetitions. If I did eight bicep curls, that would be one set of eight. If I took a rest for two minutes and then come back and did another set of eight, that would be two sets. You need two minutes rest in between sets. So if I just did eight and then eight again, that wouldn't necessarily be two good sets because you need to recover those muscles between the sets. So two minutes rest in between. You might go around, do all the exercises once and then come around, do them all again. Eight to 15 repetitions and two fatigue. Here's the key, right? Pushing those muscles to fatigue somewhere between eight and 15 repetitions. If you can get to 15 and you feel like, oh, I can keep going, time to up the weight. Because what happens? Remember that picture of that muscle, that drawing of the muscle? If I'm not challenging those muscles, I'm only using a small portion of those muscle fibers. When you're pushing to fatigue, you're getting the whole muscle. You're getting all those muscle fibers that you can activate. So pushing to fatigue is most important. Breathing as you're doing that is really important. You could do that with free weights, machines, exercise bands, water dumbbells in a water aerobics class, as long as you're getting those muscles to fatigue. It becomes very important after surgery, after that six weeks after surgery, and we'll talk about that in a second. Okay, each major muscle group. So when you're doing cardio for your legs, people say, well, I don't need to use my legs, I'm walking, they get enough strength. Do you? No, right? Because you're only using a small portion of those muscle fibers. So you gotta do the leg exercises too. Those are your biggest metabolism boosters, biggest muscles. So you wanna do legs, core, and including those smaller muscle groups that I talked about, the shoulders, the back, the knees, okay? 
unless contraindicated means that if you have something like fibromyalgia, MS, rheumatoid arthritis, we not, but might not push you to fatigue. So when we meet, we would talk about you specifically and how to use those guidelines for you specifically. Okay. All right, so how much strength do you need in your vision? All those things that you wrote down that you want to do, that you want to feel like, how much strength is that going to require? You want to start building that now? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, I love this one that she sent me a picture of shoveling snow. Not that she likes shoveling snow, but she has no excuse to tell people that they have to do it now because she can do it. I don't want to think about snow on a day like today, right? <laughs> <laughs> Any questions about strength training? All right, easy to do. You could do it at a gym. You could do it at home. Really, it's one of the easier things, I think, to fit in um, because it's simple. You could do it at home. Okay, myth number seven. Stretching is not worth my time. A lot of people don't stretch because when we started exercising when we were younger, you didn't need to stretch that much, you know? As we get older, our muscles lose some elasticity and they are more likely to get tight. And so if you have ever picked up a pencil or something light and pulled your back out, that's from a tight muscle. Tight muscles are more likely to tear and pull and spasm. And so if you think about stretching, maybe you want to use the word resetting. That when you're exercising, the muscles get tight, or when you're under stress, the muscles get tight, and when you're stretching, you're resetting those muscles back to their resting length. And then those resting muscles probably are much less likely to tear and pull. Okay, so resetting sounds something more like what you have to do. Does it burn a lot of calories? No. Stretching doesn't burn a lot of calories. Does it make you feel good? Yeah, probably. Okay, especially if you have pain issues, especially if you have fibromyalgia. Okay, big time reasons to stretch. If you have any pain issues, the pain causes muscle tightness. The muscle tightness causes more pain. You've got this vicious cycle going on. Stretching breaks that cycle. So stretching is one of those things that really does help you feel better. And if you feel better, you might want to move more, okay? And so sometimes people just start with a stretching program. I'm going to stretch at the end of every day, and then I wake up, and I feel better, and I feel like moving a little bit more. That might be a good place to start, all right? Relaxation, stress management. Exercise lowers um, the stress level. It switches the body from, re from stress mode, kind of activation mode, into that relaxation mode, okay, in the nervous system. And so ex stretching after exercise really helps you deepen that relaxation effect from exercise. If you take a five minute time to stretch and relax as you're stretching and you just breathe and you say, wow, I feel so good, you know, and you just relax, you're gonna leave that exercise session feeling maybe a little calmer, a little more relaxed, which is always a good thing. When we're calm and relaxed, we can think clearly. It's when we're stressed that we make automatic decisions and we make automatic decisions, we're looking for comfort, sometimes that comes from food, <laughs> right? So if we can relax a little bit more, we can make a good decision about how to handle stress and, and a lot of times reduce some stress eating. So, um, so relaxing as you're stretching. If you take that five minutes and you're relaxing, you're gonna say, wow, I feel so good. And recognizing how good you feel after exercise, the next time you go and you think, oh, I don't wanna exercise, I'm too tired. Oh, but you know what, I felt really good after that session. Really, really being aware of how good you feel after exercise and really aware of that while you're stretching. So all of these things are a great reason to add in a good stretch after exercise. We used to think it had to be before. It doesn't necessarily have to. The research is still out on stretching. But for most of us, for general fitness, stretching after is probably more beneficial than stretching before. Warming up is important, getting the body temperature up, starting slowly, but stretching doesn't warm up the body temperature. Stretching is a great way to reset the muscles, so do it afterwards. Holding a stretch, not bouncing, just holding a stretch for anywhere between 10 and 60 seconds, coming out slowly, and not forcing that muscle. So here's where we really listen to the muscles and we really pay attention and not push them into stretching, but just feeling a mild pulling, but not pain. If there's pain, you back up. Remember, pain makes the muscles tighten. Okay, breathing, relaxing. Any questions about stretching? This is, again, this is not the goal, but this is what one of the patients has embraced. And she got into your, what? <laughs> We're not allowed to do that, no. But this is what she has embraced, and she's shown me pictures of her all along, and it's really exciting for her, and she really has gotten into yoga. I want to do that. See, yeah, someone might say, you know what? I, that's my goal. And so, um, so you might take yoga and really embrace it, and really, um, you know, this, again, this is an extreme. But um, for her, this was really so exciting to be able to do these things where she couldn't do them before, and isn't that great? So how flexible do you need to be? Maybe not that flexible, but how flexible do you need to be for your, for your vision and the things that you want to do? 
um, how relaxed do you want to feel? So adding in a little stretching might help you get there, even now. He completed the Barry Hill Triathlon. He's doing all kinds of great stuff, too. Um, so keeping exercise safe, all right? This is just really important to make sure that um, you're paying attention. A lot of things we've talked about, but one thing I want to make sure I mention is cardiac symptoms, heart symptoms, um, because sometimes they're deceiving. And when you start exercising more, this is when those symptoms might come up. A typical heart symptom would be anything above your waist, any symptom that's above your waist that comes on when you exert yourself and goes away with rest, or comes on with stress and goes away with rest. So it might be a little burning in your chest. It might be an ache in your left arm. Typically, it'll come on when you're exerting yourself more, like you're walking up a hill, or you crank up the treadmill a little bit, or you're walking up your stairs. And then when you stop, it would tend to go away. And that's where people sometimes end up missing those cardiac symptoms, those heart symptoms. Because they say, oh, it went away. It's fine. It only happens when I go up the stairs. It's not a big deal. But it means that when your heart is working a little harder, it's not getting enough oxygen and it's sending you those signals, okay? It could be heartburn. It could be your heart. It, it, who knows, right? But better to check it out. So just being aware as you start to increase your exercise, if you notice any symptoms that tend to come on when you exert yourself and then go away when you rest, anything. It could be anything above your waist. Some people have pain. Some people have tingling. Some people have just an ache. Um, but noticing that and just calling your doctor and saying, hey, I'm getting this symptom. Can we just check it out? Make sure it's not my heart. Okay. Um, avoiding sudden starts and stops. We talked about that. Gradually adding more activity, that 10% rule. Um, go easy on competition. Right? All these pictures, people are competing and everything. But competition takes you away from what your body's doing. So especially in the beginning, if you're a competitive person and you're exercising around other people, even if it's the person next to you on the treadmill is running and you think, oh, I should be running, you know, notice when you're tempted to do more than your body's ready to do and really listen to what, okay, what would be best for me? Like taking precautions in the extreme heat and cold, especially after surgery, don't increase sweating, those kind of things. Staying hydrated, wearing shoes, proper shoes, proper footwear, okay? So before and after surgery, we've talked about all these things before surgery. Right now, the goals are getting on a good cardiovascular routine in any way that you can, even if that's accumulating 30 minutes. But 30 minutes three times a week at that moderate to somewhat heavy intensity, benefits of that, right? We talked about those. Getting a stronger heart for surgery, helping to reduce the um, fat around the organs, okay, and better recovery rate. Taking care of those challenges that are not going to change after surgery. Right? Sometimes people will say to me, well, after surgery, it's going to be so much easier. I'll just exercise. It'll be so much easier. I'll feel I have more energy. But you know what? That job isn't going to change, and the, all the demands of your family aren't going to change, probably. So you know, what are the things that are not going to change no matter what your weight is? And work around those now, figuring out how to fit it in. Even, like I said, if it's only a regular stretching routine, but you're practicing carving out that time, that's most important really putting it in your schedule now. So that after surgery, you just pick up where you left off. It just becomes part of what you do. If you can accomplish that now, that is a huge thing. Um, many things change after surgery, many things that you have to change after surgery. If this routine is not one of them, that's really helpful. So putting those things in now. After surgery, the first six weeks uh, is really about healing. You're not eating a lot of calories. You've just had major surgery. You've got these incisions that take about six weeks to heal. And so over the first six weeks, it's about healing. Exercise movement will help promote healing. But too much movement will, will reduce healing, OK? And actually could slow down the weight loss process. So the appropriate amount is what gives you energy. You're going to feel tired the first couple of weeks. You're still recovering from surgery. And so you might just do a five or 10 minute walk, just light movement several times throughout the day. But what that does is it helps with circulation. It helps with healing. And it helps with digestion. So it helps things move through your system. So using activity in that time, some kind of light walking, some light cardiovascular exercise, nothing that involves the abdominal muscles and nothing too intense. And then once you get your energy back, and you'll know when you're ready, you can get back to your regular cardiovascular exercise, as long as it's not swimming right away, OK? You have to wait about four or five weeks until that incision is ready for you to go in a pool. And as long as it's nothing that really involves the strong abdominal muscles, OK, like Zumba or something like that. Okay, but walking, things like that, getting back to cardio, um, gradually increasing back to your cardio. At six weeks, what are you going to do? Our best friend here, right? 
strength training, hold on to that muscle. For the first six weeks, you could do probably light weights, no abdominal work, okay? But at six weeks, when those abdominal muscles are healed and the surgical team says, okay, you're back to full activity, you can come right down and see me right afterwards. You can schedule an appointment with me the same day and we'll get you back on strength training. But pick up that strength training routine at that six week mark, gradually increase. You probably will lose some muscle over those six weeks, okay? It's just the way it is. But you can gain it back, because now you know those fibers are there, so even if you lose muscle, you can gain it back. But six weeks and beyond, equal amounts of strength training and cardio, equally as important, okay? What do you think, doable? Isn't that good news, right? You've got some support. You know what you have to do. You know what not to waste your time on. Okay, and it really will only take, you know, six 30-minute sessions a week, three of strength training, three of cardio, and you've got the basics there, okay? So it doesn't have to take a lot of time, it just has to be consistent. Most of all, it should make you feel good. So if you walk away from any exercise session not feeling good mentally or physically, it's time to look at it and change it, okay? That's your, that's your, that's your test. You should walk away feeling good mentally, like, yeah, I did it, I feel so good, and physically, I have some more energy, I feel really good. Okay. <laughs> um, let's see what else. This is that same woman who was running. She said, "Oh, my friend was parasailing. I figured it's not on my bucket list, but I'll try it." <laughs> and so, um, so consistency, a balanced routine of all those pieces of that program. Keep it realistic. Set realistic goals. It should be energizing and connected to what's important to you. That will be your motivation to keep you going. Keep that vision of you at your healthiest self in mind. Okay. Any questions? <laughs>